Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Alien vs. Predator Galaxy podcast, the original Alien and Predator podcast. This is uh, regular host Aaron Percival, a.k.a. Corporal Hicks, and joining me is one of my squad mates, my uh, last Lobas, is uh, Mr. Adam Zeller. A.k.a. Ridgetop on our forums. Hello again, everyone. Indeed. And if you're watching the YouTube version, you've already been spoiled. You can already see two new faces on either corner of the screen right now. And if you're listening to the audio version, you will hear their voices shortly. I'd like to welcome two very special community guests to the show. Um, I'll go I'll go next to me. So uh, first up, we have uh, Sarah. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hey, Aaron. Who is... Not on the forums, but I've known her for a couple of years now on Twitter. Um, she's always been one to ask me my thoughts on the books, because I know she's been reading them as well. So when it came to adding some extra voices to this episode, I was like, I know who I can ask. I know <laughs> who I might want to jump on and natter aliens with us. So uh, thank you for joining us, Sarah. Yeah, no problem at all. It's good to be here. And uh, we'll we'll learn a little more about Sarah in a bit as well. But let me introduce our fourth guest on the podcast on this episode. He has been on the boards for four or five years, I think, at this point. Yeah, is a uh, Mr. Ziggs. Welcome, Ziggs. Hello, it's a pleasure. Long time listener, first time uh, participant. I always love hearing that. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> yeah, o- always, always, uh, always gives me a tickle. Um, so yeah, Ziggs, is, uh, Ziggs has been on the boards for ages. He's always um, contributing towards the book and comic discussions as well, aren't you? Yep. Uh, Pretty much I my think... favorite section is the literature section, so that's where I hang out. Well, the expanded universe is generally so fun. You know, it's it's a gr- great part of Valian and Predator because it fleshes it out so much. Sometimes in good ways, sometimes in not so good ways. Um, and I think this this episode might prove to be a uh, an interesting one um because i i kind of have i like to go into these not knowing what people think uh, what the part uh, what we think of them but i have an idea of how everybody here um reacted to this book so i'm very curious to see how we're we're gonna go on here um so uh, we are talking aliens vasquez uh, by v castro it came out towards the end of 20. 20- 22 i forgot what year it was then um with this uh one of titan's better covers i'll be honest i think um definitely a step up from their normal ones although was, i don't really like the um, shiny was this one of the was this one of the artworks that was in the um 40 year was it the 40 year artwork anniversary what was the what, latest one that no. came out because there was one from the top wasn't there <clears throat> i can't think what what one you mean? Uh, you know, they brought out the... It was more recent. No, the, the, the printed in blood one. Yes. Yeah, I, I, no, I, don't, I don't think any of the Titan stuff's been in any of the um, the art books. I might it's, be it, it, it's definitely a step up, but I, I wouldn't call it one of my favourite pieces of uh, alien artwork, I'll be honest. But yeah, it's definitely a, a step up in Titans games. Um, I still have yet to get a physical copy. I read it digitally myself. Uh, but yes, and you, you were talking about getting a signed copy of that book before you even read it. That's true, and I still, I still would like to. It's just been off the radar a little bit. Uh, but yes, thank you for joining us, uh, Sarah and Ziggs. And even though this isn't an interview podcast, uh, a little tradition we like to have whenever we have <laughs> new guests is uh, talking about the first time you came across our favorite extraterrestrial monster, the alien. So, Sarah, why don't you start off and just let us know how you got started being a fan of Alien? Yeah, I mean, I grew up in the 80s, so it was kind of the perfect time to start watching the Aliens film. So I actually watched the second uh, film first, um, and I think I might have even watched the third film before I watched the first one. Exactly um, the same for me. Exactly <laughs> yeah, I, 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 and I think um, I'd, I'd, I'd already seen Terminator 
So, and I'd already seen Ghostbusters and I'd already seen a number of things. So, you know, I recognised uh, Hicks and I recognised Ripley, well, Sigourney and uh, Michael Bean, of course. Um, so they were actors I was already familiar with in uh, other films. Um, so, yeah, that, it, it, and it started from there, really. And I'll be honest, I don't think really I started exploring the expanded universe until pro- maybe 10 years ago. I think I was just blissfully unaware of of everything that was out there and then suddenly you know it kind of came onto my horizon and I became obsessed um I think would be fair to say and suddenly it's every graphic novel and every comic and every book and um it was kind of cool in that way because there was a lot of material there to kind of digest um and it, it kept me going for a long time um but I think that from a why aliens perspective and what makes it different for me, um, uh, having started with the second film, obviously great cast, great script, great film. It was exactly, you know, the 80s film tropes, but just heightened. Uh, but for me, it was the it was the the creature itself. It's just impossible. It's impossible. Um, you know, it, 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 anything that you get past from it being incredibly scary, from the size of it, to its talons, to its tail, to its inner mandible, um, to acid for blood, so it's going to take you out as it dies. I just never seen anything like it. I don't think there's anything else out there that exists like it. And that probably is what was the biggest pull for me, even with a fantastic heroine, such as Ripley. So that's me. Cool. How about you, Ziggs? Um, I think I was probably about, I think it was right when Resurrection came out. So I think I was like maybe nine years old and I saw like a behind the scenes, like making of on, I think like discovery channel or something like that. And my dad saw me how much I was like, Whoa, that's super cool. And so he put on the first alien for me. We watched it like right afterwards. And then I watched Aliens, Alien 3, and, and much later I finally saw Resurrection. Um, and he also actually collected all the comics. So then I got into all the early comics, like as a, you know, nine, 10 year old. And just, I read through pretty much all of them up to Kidnap. And that's when he stopped collecting because he didn't like the direction they were going at that time. <laughs> that, that, was, that was towards the end of the Golden Age. No. It was. It was like 97, I think, when, yeah. when that one came out. So it was there's only a couple more arcs that came out after that. So hmm. yeah. And I've just been a huge fan ever since, you know, and never miss a, never miss a, miss a book or a comic that releases or video game. Well, here's a question as well, then for both of you, before we, we get into this one favorite of the current run of Titans and least favorite of Titans currents. Um, favorite would still probably be uh cold forge least, right. least favorite. Um, probably that covenant origins one. It, that one just okay. didn't do it for me. <laughs> okay. No, that that's fair. I can understand that one. Uh, I still think this potential and, and to be fair, that might be a topic that comes up talking about this one. I think there's room in the expanded universe for alien less alien books. Um, Covenant Origins didn't didn't hit that mark for me, which was a shame because it was ADF. For God's sake, it was Andy Foster, you know. But what whatever, Sarah, you, go ahead. Favorite and least favorite. Um, my my favorite is Phalanx. Um, that is one of the times. Another good yeah. shout, yeah. Oh, I yeah. just I yeah, that blew my socks off. Um, and my least favorite is uh, Colony Colony. Uh, I mean Colony War. <laughs> so so bad you've forgotten the name no it's it's there was no war in it it was just a colony oh okay a colony oh. so colony colony <laughs> no, that is absolutely fair you get 100 percent marks for that I fucking hate that book so much we so still much haven't done a proper book. podcast on oh, that's book, because Eric. i refuse i refuse to do an episode on that it's we mentioned shit. it briefly on the inferno's fall podcast but... it comes up every episode these days <laughs> Just as to the anger that goes on. Uh, no. Inferno's Four, I really liked. I really enjoyed Inferno's Four. I did. I thought that was. I thought that was good. But there's a line. There. Okay. So, um, Vasquez, I'll try and give a brief uh, rundown of this book. There is no synopsis for me to read off the back of, but 
Um, it won't be quite as detailed as uh, Lee's summary of uh, EVP Armageddon. Uh, which you, you guys won't. Oh, there is yes, but I'll I'll still try and go through it a little bit. So it it's separated into multiple parts. Um, the first of which five parts. Yes, thank you, Ziggs. Uh, the first part of which is focused on Vasquez, as we know her from the films, um, Jeanette Vasquez, and it's very much her upbringing to the point where she is in uh joins the marines basically so it, it's her life um the difficulties her family faced and then uh, her being orphaned and getting involved in a life of crime uh, getting wrongly sentenced um and put in jail and then the thing that I think a lot of us know but we were talking about this off the air last time and uh, trying to remember where it came from was uh where that particular tidbit about the juvenile um, recruitment, juvenile prison recruitment came from. I only remember it from the Aliens Legacy website for the very, very old DVD box set. But I, I, I had a quick flick through the scripts. I didn't quite see it in there. I feel like it must have come from ADF's book, uh, novelization. But I know, it, I know it's existed before that website, and I know it's been a thing before this book. Um, but yeah, so that that was the first part of the book. And then the rest of it all focuses on her twin children. And again, it goes through the same sort of story beats of, of their upbringing and their life with her, their aunt and uh, early age and the direction they wanted to, to go in life. And her daughter, um, Leticia, um, follows very much in, in Jeanette's footsteps and aims to become a marine although she goes very specifically special forces uh, the raiders as they go specifically in this book um which i thought was to, to start with i was like is that a shout to the fan group and then i looked into it and, and raiders is a um a thing it is a, a genuine military thing not just this particular fan group of uh, colonial marine raiders whereas ramon her son um joins the corporate world it's one of those evil Wayland Utani baddies. So a, a, a bulk, the bulk of it is around that sort of journey, is their development and growth, until we get to the last part of the book, which is them heading off planet and getting stuck into classic aliens adventures, um, where <laughs> experiments go awry as they do when um, upper management, who have no clue, stick their nose in and make all the wrong decisions, and then things go wrong. Um, and that's very much classic aliens tale where it's a, uh, planet that's been specifically selected because it's off the, it's off the beaten path. Nobody knows about it. They plump a secret experiment, a secret facility there, and then a not so secret facility there. And yeah, everything goes awry. Not a very specific, um, summary because there's actually a lot of, stuff in i think narratively in the book there is a lot in there to go through but that is the general story beats of it um i will read the synopsis anyway just so you guys get the official uh official summary from titan so even before the doomed mission to hadley's hope jeanette vasquez had to fight to survive born to an immigrant family with a long military tradition she looked up to the stars but life pulled her back down to earth, first into a street gang, then prison. The colonial marines proved to be Vasquez's way out, a way that forced her to give up her twin children. Raised by Jeanette's sister Rosanna, those children, Letitia and Ramon, had been forced to discover their own ways to survive. Letitia by following her mother's path into the military, Ramon by embracing the corporate hierarchy of Wayland Utani. Their paths converge on an unnamed plant, unnamed world, which some see as a potential utopia, while others would use it for highly secretive research. Regardless of what humans might have planned for it, however, Xenomorphs will turn the planet into a living hell. <laughs> Sarcastic, sexy, and action packed, Vasquez brings generational heritage into the alien universe in an explosive way. I never, I didn't really find the book sarcastic. I'm not going to lie. Uh, so I, I, I would I say I also didn't find it particularly sexy, but 
there were there were some significant romance elements in in the the book, and we'll we'll get into that. Indeed. So, uh, Ziggs, start us off. Uh, we like to do a, a very brief summary of you know a brief review of, of our impressions of the book, and um, yeah, go for it. So uh, this, I would say, this is the most character development we've gotten of any aliens novel so I, th I feel like it was more i think it actually could have been marketed as a ya novel to a degree because it was kind of a coming of age story more or less between uh leticia and ramon so it's kind of i felt like there's themes of greed kind of matched with gener the the need to go for that generational wealth that was mentioned many times so i, I felt that that was a theme generational wealth and ramon kind of did whatever he could to get to it but uh my main critique would be that there just wasn't enough aliens action you know i said that on the boards um it's really not to the last fifth of the book i suppose since it's five parts it's that last that fifth part that's the main alien action so um i had fun with it i would have preferred more aliens but that's because that's what we're here for but overall you know i like the book i'd maybe give it a 6.57 out of 10. Okay. Adam, how did you feel? So, um, I thought this book was, was interesting. Um, there wasn't, um, I, I agree with you, Ziggs. There wasn't enough aliens in this alien book. Uh, on my Kindle, I think it said about 40%, uh, uh sorry, sorry, 80% before we start seeing the first kind of alien conflict. Um, which I, I also agree with you, Aaron. I feel like there's room for the alien expanded universe to explore stories without aliens. But when you have the big aliens title on the book, you expect a bit, a bit more, I think. Uh, but it was interesting seeing Jeanette Vasquez's younger years. And I wish we would have seen more of that because really not much of the book is focused on her. It's more so focused on her legacy, her children. And we go from their teenage years until pretty much their thirties, it would seem. Um, I think that it does fall into some contrivances in terms of the everyone's related kind of trope, which sometimes works with Amanda Ripley, which we were proven wrong about Aaron, but I don't know. The Vasquez family line is super unlucky, man, between this and the, the comics with, with Cutter and uh, Carmen Vasquez. It's like, man, this, this family just cannot catch a break from the aliens. So, um, I think and next, it, I think next to the Ripley, name and the, and the ripley lineage vasquez has the most interactions she, with she alien. has more honestly i mean maybe you could count ripley's later descendant in you do, um, yeah yeah you have to uh river of pain right no it's yeah, cf sorrows cf sorrows yeah. that's right i always Although, i wish they hadn't have given him the name decca i was like but that just makes me think of decca from aliens no it sh should have been something different but overall i and as far as the romance goes, uh, and we talked about this earlier too, Aaron, I did find it a bit fan fiction-y, uh, and we'll we'll get into that as well. Um, so there were some problems there for me in terms of the the corporate intrigue, um, and I feel like we could have gone into things a bit more with the military training, both with um, Jeanette Vasquez as well as Leticia Vasquez. But there were some things that did really well. I really liked the explorations into the Mexican culture. I thought. All the Santa Muerte stuff was really interesting. Um, Aaron, you and I both played a bit of Ghost Recon Wildlands. So I, there was a lot of that Santa Muerte imagery in that, that game. So it was cool to see that explored a bit more. Um, so were there some things that the book did well? And, and I felt like the writing flowed really well. Like I could, I could get through it. It didn't feel like a chore. Um, but there was just a lot of not what I'm looking for in an alien book, unfortunately. Um, and that may be completely subjective, but I don't know if I'd recommend this to alien fans. Honestly, for me, I think it would, if I was being generous, maybe a six, but I think I'd probably be closer to a five, just pretty, pretty average for me. How about you, Sarah? Um, I feel like um, I, there's a danger that I'm just going to repeat a lot of what's just already been said, because I am very much in agreement from a the richness of the characters, and I think, uh, to Zig's point, I completely agree. And then, for me, it became much more lacking when that same time and effort 
probably just through through the length of the book wasn't given to the other product the, the other characters because they just became so forgettable because you'd spent so much time with the Letitias and the Ramones and 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 Jeanette and Rosanna so for the characters that we did know a lot about I actually really liked them um there were some skeezy bits with Ramon that I thought were probably unnecessarily but generally um I liked his arc it made sense um that they would go in different directions and up until kind of that part in the book where their Letitia went her way and Ramon started going to his, I was a hun- I was all in. I was really enjoying it. Great writing. Um, the introduction of Brenda Moon, I thought she was good. Um, Alinka One sounded very interesting as a planet. Uh, well, the planet that it's set on and the research facility um, and the research that they were doing, whether it be the, the tapeworms or the, the um, fasciitis. I, I, I was all in. I was really enjoying it. Um, I can't say the same for the second half of the book um, or maybe the the third part of it. Um, but I think it's a I think it's a shame. I think there was a lot there and I think it, it had perhaps made some slightly different choices and everyone not being related. My um, criticisms and confusion around the Vicar's timeline and how she exactly found this planet aside. I didn't hate it, um, but it's not it's not there for me. So similar to Ziggs, if I was going to say to give it a rating, I would probably be at six and a half as well. Um, the things that I liked, I really liked. But unfortunately, it felt like everything else was so much more lacking in the face of that. So. Okay, that's fair. And remember to bring up the, the timeline stuff later. Sarah. Okay, so. I... When this book was first announced, my reaction was that gift from two guys, a girl in a pizza place, of Ryan Reynolds pulling his face mask down going, but why? Because Vasquez has, yes, has run into the aliens. The the Vasquez family has run into the aliens so many times. And with Aftermath being such a recent release as well, it was like last year, Adam? Year before, some it is recent. Yeah, I think and, it was. Uh, yeah, I think it was 2021. It was maybe. the first year that Marvel had the license. They released it within that first year, and Cutter so, was mentioned in the book, actually. Yes, um, which I actually I liked that somebody had, that they'd mentioned Cutter, and I liked that they mentioned Carmen, who is her younger sister from Aliens, Colonial Marines. That those were definitely additions that came about from consultants. I could totally tell that. Um, because they barely warranted any mention throughout most of this. Although although uh, Cutter's parents did get a bit more of a focus later on, which was like a very small focus, but it, it was fleshed out a bit more in terms of relationships later on, which was nice. But yeah, I was like, the book had to convince me to start with. I went into this one not thinking... That it, I was going to really enjoy it. I didn't think I'd enjoy the um, Jeanette's early stuff, and I didn't think I would enjoy another Vasquez uh, family alien feud. The book really surprised me because I fucking loved the Jeanette stuff. I really, really enjoyed the first part of this book detailing Jeanette's uh, background and the events that led to her uh, joining the Clone Marines. Um, you know, there's some issues along the way. Um, I felt like the COVID analogy was maybe a bit too raw. Um, or maybe I'm just a bit too sick of having those analogies at the minute. Um, and the problem I have throughout the book, and I think is my main issue with the book, is that it, it always feels contemporary. It never quite feels like a book set in, you know, 100 years into the future. Um it could it could have done more with that. It could have been more, especially given how the book goes later on, where it's a lot of with both Jeanette and Letitia, it's a lot of boot camp, it's a lot of training. It could have gone a bit more Starship Troopers in that regards. And I'm talking the book, not the film. It could have gone a bit more future feel there. So that was a big problem I had with it going throughout the book. But I really enjoyed that backstory. I really enjoyed uh, Jeanette's journey and the the her being um, innocent you know that is never something i would have th- thought of i didn't expect it you know and i looked into it later you know uh, she has the ta- 
the the eye drop tattoo. Um, I think many people, the assumption is that's a tattoo for she's killed somebody. That's a murderer's tattoo. But there's other meanings for it as well, and that is simply incarceration. So either way, you know, it works. She has been incarcerated. She was in prison. I, I love that part of the book. I, I loved all her journey. Um, it got the reactions from me that it intended. You know, I was genuinely angry <laughs> when all the stuff was happening to her about um, the forced sterilization and, and giving her kids up and stuff like that, you know, uh, because there is a lot of political commentary in this yeah. book. Police oh, misconduct as well. Yeah, especially early on, um, you know, the gang culture and um, women's rights, because how the fuck is that still a thing? Because that came back around again, didn't it, in the States recently? You know, um, autonomy over uh, the female body. Um, so it got the reactions it wanted from me, and I, I was genuinely angry at the judge in the book. Um, so I love that. I would have loved far more of Jeanette in this because I didn't really like Letitia and Ramon. I didn't find them massively interesting characters um, because it, it felt like it was repeating a bit of Jeanette's journey, you know, and that's very specific because Letitia is following in her footsteps, but it, it didn't feel unique. I felt like I'd already had some of this in the book and I started to get a bit bored because it didn't feel... It didn't feel aliens, and I don't mean that in the sense that there weren't aliens in it. It just never felt like anything other than it could have been some other franchise. It could have been some generic sci-fi military thing, and that's the feel that the bulk of the book has for me. And again, a lot of that's to do with the contemporaneous of it, but it's also to do with it just didn't feel aliens to me. Uh, Brenda Moon, I loved. Um, I really enjoyed a lot of Brenda Moon's uh, introduction and the interludes with her in between because that is where the book did feel aliens and she was also an interesting character because she was one of those mad scientists who wasn't mad and had her head screwed on and her protocols with the aliens were you know reasonable and worked until till Vickers shows up and not Vickers um Utani Utani shows up and fucks it all over because upper management never fucking knows what they're doing so that was really cool. And I actually really liked those bits with uh, Dr. Moon and, and the alien actual experiments in the book. You know, when the, the alien virus mold thing came up, I was like, oh, Labyrinth, this is a Labyrinth reference. Yes. Uh, so all that sort of stuff I was really into. And like the evolution that Brenda Moon thought the Queen was going through, where they, I thought it was brilliant. They, cut off all the limbs they cut off half a face they cut a tongue out and injected these um the the virus the mold stuff into the queen's head into like you know time capsules i was like this is really good this is this is interesting i really like this stuff um but yes yeah, the, the bulk of the book i didn't really enjoy and then the last fifth when they go to a actually leave earth <laughs> and go somewhere uh, somewhere in space it was all very rushed and confusing i think at a lot of points um which was a shame so i didn't hate the book it didn't offend me like colony wars did colony wars legitimately offended me i was just kind of a bit ambivalent towards this one it, it's one of the ones where it's like yes there's things in it that i really like and things i found really interesting but i would have liked to have them to have been the focus of their own thing um so it was a bit of a miss for me i would probably say a five out of ten um yeah sorry folk sorry v castro um 20 2022 wasn't a very good titan year for me i'll be honest i only liked about half of what came out i mean think... part of that comes down to our personal expectations too i mean v castro is a solid writer like she writes well i thought the book flowed nicely you know and i as a creative yeah it's um not everything lands the same so it, yeah I, I always it is kind of a bummer when we don't like stuff but that's just how it goes in the expanded universe sometimes and i'm i'm with you aaron like i didn't dislike it like i didn't find it offensive I'm, i wasn't like this is terrible it was just kind of like eh, 
well, that was an alien book, you know. Well, kind of. Yeah, an alien I, book. I think I saw. Yeah, I think I saw someone. Someone else was talking about it, and um, they were talking about it. Feels like it. It could or should have been two, two books. It, there's two books worth of material in there, and I think that they're in some ways. I would agree with that because I think there's so much that could have gone into and been explored more like her time when she was going through training, everything that you just talked about, Aaron. Um, the writing itself was excellent. Um, the time actually on the planet, but would I wanted to have read two books on it? I don't, I, I'm not sure whether I actually would have read like Vasquez part one and Vasquez part two. So I think yeah. maybe it's out differently, but I, I don't know whether I could have read two on it. I just think it should have been more focused on Jeanette because mm -hmm. I, I agree with you on that as well, Aaron. I thought the beginning part, her incarceration, her life as a youth in this gang group uh, was really interesting. And her military training was just kind of brushed over rather briefly. I hope so. And I'm like, Vasquez is a smart gunner. Like, let's talk about that a little bit. Cause there was a whole like part of uh, her pregnancy where she couldn't train and she, well, she couldn't train physically. So she was doing, only firearm yeah. training. I'm like, let's get into that a little bit. And that can kind of bring us to this futuristic setting because again, you're right, Aaron, this felt very contemporary. They were all referencing modern songs, a lot That's, of modern social commentary. That was the biggest, I think, part of why the book felt contemporary. There was one piece of conceit, I think early on, maybe it was, was it when they were in the car um, with the gang members where they're talking about old or classic rap music. I think that was the only only time they ever referenced any of the music being oldies, classics, you know, that kind of thing. Every other time it was just the name of the song, the artist. Apparently Vasquez has a real thing for Bruce Springsteen, was it? You know, Dan Dancing in the Dark, was that the song that they referenced multiple yep. times? Yep. And then it's it's things like phones and watches. You know, it, this is going to sound like a real stupid nitpicky complaint, but that dates that dates it in the terminology of the now. You know, there's there's it's a simple thing. You know, you don't call it a phone. You you call it something different. Well, the isolation novelization was calling them like, oh, I forget, I forget what they were calling it, but they, it was essentially the same idea. But it was it was, um pads or, or terminals or something like that you know you disguise the the technology in different language to give it a feel of the not now and yeah yeah it's, it's gonna uh, this is a problem sort of with alien in general anyway yeah, because it's joking. retro it's retro futurism and you can still do it now we've seen we've seen that's... ripley with the clunky watch so they have the smart watches anyway sorry sarah you were gonna no, now you see, I thought it was intentional. So maybe I, listen, maybe I missed something completely, but it felt as though um, a lot of the setting of the book early on, obviously before they go onto different planets, a lot of it was felt like it was intentionally timeless almost. You know, the twins go and live on a ranch. It's in the middle of nowhere. There's no flying cars. There's no talk about atmospheric processes or anything else. They're literally living on a... It's, it's, it, there is a timeless quality to it. And, you know, the artists that we're talking about, I would say pretty timeless as well. I And if I think about all the stuff that they're talking about in Ziggs, you're going to know a lot more about this than I am. So apologies. Um, uh, which is when they talk about all history and her feeling, uh, you know, Jeanette feeling as though her ancestors are with her and she feels so tied to the past. I jumped to the conclusion that it was intentional within this book. That's what that's, I took from it. That's an interesting thought because I hadn't read it that way. And um, uh, David Ziggs, you you unmuted. Go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just gonna say they did mention uh, Peter Wayland, uh, kind of combating climate change at one point in the book, so it was mentioned. And then I think they also kind of touched on that the uh, what's his name Robert Boone. He, he was kind of self-sustaining with his with his millionaire million acre or he was like a millionaire with a big horse farm so mm -hmm. i think i think that that kind of glossed over why it felt so modern at least in terms of them growing up in that 
wide open space because i know when i think of futures i think of like congested cities with tons of smog and stuff so i she made some effort to i think address those things so like i i agree with hicks that it was just a bit too modern especially with the constant reference of the of the songs and it's like i agree with alien even in the far future you don't have to go like super dystopian and i think some bits of the expanded universe have made that mistake they go too in the direction of like blade runner where it's too bleak uh which alien has that aspect of dystopianism but it's not like taken to the extreme like we see in other sci-fi franchises at least i've never gotten that impression um but yeah there uh, it's always going back to your point aaron about the aesthetics of, of alien and the retro futurism it's always a weird tug of war between the clunky retro sci-fi stuff of the originals and making it feel grounded in, in the future and relatable for us now. Like you see with games like alien isolation, you have tape players, devices and things like that. And then with alien covenant, well, you have law, tablets, you know, you have an iPad. And, the law and... actually goes into it though, in isolation, if I remember rightly. Does it just because it's yeah, such to, an to old stage? The they are, okay. Some yeah, it, it was to explain like the reliability of of some of the retro sort well, the, of technology. The, yeah, the non hackability. Oh, you can't you. hack tapes. That's very true. That, that you know what that's a great thing about the uh, the RPG is 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 its intent to reconcile a lot of those disparities around the lore and the franchise and um, the. The, the story, the overarching story is going off. Anyway, uh, not to diverge, Adam, sorry, you were saying. Oh, just that it's like, I I think, I don't know, it's for me, it's the right way to do it is somewhere in the middle. Like we want something that seems futuristic from where we are now. And again, we see that with the alien prequels, like how much more advanced those ships are. And yeah, you can just be like, well, these are just more advanced ships. And it's like, Mm, come on it's just because it's a sci-fi movie that we're making now instead of in the 70s or in the 80s um but you do want to you do want to kind of meet in the middle so it kind of is a bit cohesive in the lore i do think all the the prequel stuff can be explained away very nicely because yes it is a nostromo was a a truck (laughs) a dirty beat down old worn down truck and then it's the flagship scientific thing and a um, a yeah, colony ship sent up. Have iPads today? I'm like, <laughs> I mean, there, there's still lots of beat down vehicles going around. That's true. Um, but yeah, uh, Ziggs, Ziggs was spot on as well. You know, referencing uh, all the climate change stuff. But I, I, I feel like the book would have done a better job of not feeling so contemporary if it had contrasted. You know, we have a lot of this book that spent early part of the book that's spent on this ranch you know it, it is this westerny kind of uh idyllic american kind of thing but we don't get this it you know was the early, the early book was set in la wasn't it you know that is notoriously one of america's most disgusting cities for pollution oh, and stuff not, like that it's not that bad go well, go to la first uh it has its good areas and its bad areas well, you know what I mean, though. But to, it didn't contrast that city feel to this, you know, idyllic ranch life. You know that it never felt in the future. It never felt part of this this world as Alien had established it. I mean, why the hell did training not take place on another planet, for God's sakes? You know, why couldn't you have popped some of it on the moon or Mars or something like that just to make it more put some sci-fi in your sci-fi? Well, they kept setting up this yeah, thing please. during Jeanette's military training. They were like, there's this big warehouse, which is where all the space training takes place. And we never, like, she mentions it twice, and we never get to see in there. We never get to hear about her, like, training for space expeditions. And I'm like, that would have made a really interesting part. And even her, um, you know, we see the the very end of her life in the scene in Aliens where she and Gorman mm-hmm. sacrifice themselves to to give the others a chance. But I'm like, I would have liked to have seen more of her perspective and, and mm, inner dialogue that. throughout Aliens. Like, we don't have to go through the whole cool. story of that beat for beat, but just to see a little bit more of that, I feel like it should have been balanced more between her and her kids rather than mostly focused on her kids. Um, another weird thing with the Alien franchise that's like a nitpicky fan thing is the time of space travel, for me anyway. Because uh, if you remember with the, um, the Fire and Stone comic, 
Aaron, like it took them how long? And this was like after aliens, it took them more than two years to get to LV two, two, three. And I'm like, well, we know from aliens, it only takes a few weeks at this time because the ships have gotten faster. And in this book, which takes place post alien three, it takes them five years to get the, to this planet, which I guess Brenda moon is just killing aliens before they become adults the entire time. So it doesn't like, there seems no logical time gap there. It's just like, Oh, five years have passed and we've had to say goodbye to our, our aunt now, but I'm like ships in the alien universe at this time, it should be weeks to maybe a couple months. Right. Well, we don't know how far it is. I will give it that conceit. You know, the idea is that this planet is supposed to be unknown to everybody, you know, so far off the beaten track and that kind of thing. So that's a conceit I will give it. What did. Yeah, what and, did and I, I, I dated a guy. I dated a guy in university who joined the army and trained to be in the Marines and spent all of his time in a field in Wales for two years never saw any active service and then came back out of the Marines again. So I don't know, going off a different planet and everything else, maybe that's, uh, maybe this is true to form. And it's all purely about my complaint of it never feeling aliens or futuristic. I, I, I completely own up to that, you know. Like even when they're traveling on the ship, we're not really, the spaceship is not really described much at all like even when the opportunities are right there like let's nerd out a little bit like let's talk about the weaponry let's let's do the world building as you say aaron yeah it's just not really gone into i mean i get this is a character driven story we're focusing on this family here but just give us give those fans a little something you know that that makes us feel like we're in this world the the book is quite clearly a character book you know that is where v's interest lies it is in ramon it is in leticia it is in Jeanette. And yeah, I understand that, but you know, you are also still in a franchise. You are still in a, a world that you need to get into. So, sorry, Ziggs, you 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 keep trying to to bring up something here. Go for it. Oh, uh, just the because uh, we're talking about like feeling more futuristic with the military. That very first chapter with Jeanette fighting a combat android as like her test to to get into the Marines. I really liked that part. Yeah, that that is like the most futuristic it feels, isn't it? Actually, really, yeah. that was a cool moment. You know, that's something I also want to ask you guys about. Is you know, how did you feel about Jeanette's revised? I say revised this version of Jeanette's backstory in here. You know, did you also have that same sort of reaction I did? Of do I really need this going into it? And and did it work for you? I think I I also experienced that, but. I don't know. I, I generally tend to set my expectations low for <laughs> for any uh, EU content. That's a bit of a depressing way to start it off. There's some absolute <laughs> crackers, and you know this, Mr. Cold Forge, favorite book. That, therefore, I can't be disappointed if it's bad. <laughs> so, so I'm expecting too much of these books, apparently. Uh, that's well, I fair. Mean, I... I didn't know I didn't know what to expect. So I hadn't read a synopsis. I hadn't really I knew there was the new book coming out, but it felt as if there was a flurry of titles and comics and news all kind of happening at the same time. Um so and and rather than get if I'm gonna get like five through the door within a couple of months, I don't wanna be more excited about one than the others because then, you know, I'm just reading one for the sake of it whilst I'm waiting. So I didn't I didn't look into it. I didn't spend any time reading what it was gonna be about. I mean up by the name alone, it kind of had a vibe. Um so going into it, um the way it started, Ziggs, you're hundred percent correct. I wish I'd have said that. Um it was absolutely it was an amazing start. Um, introduced Drake early. I was really glad because it kind of got that out of the way. You knew that you didn't know whether he was going to be a main part of it, but at least, he, you know, because when she came out, I think he was, was he the next one going in? Um, yeah. Um, so he got that out of the way quickly um, that she was already associated with him. So part of me was like, oh, are we going to, are we going to see the first time they meet? But it's okay. It's okay. We didn't. So I think my lack of expectation probably helped because I, I just really appreciated everything we've got. And hundred percent, I could have read more. I could have read more, but I don't know whether that might have bored me eventually. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm glad they, they had the kids, albeit as horrendous um, as her, as, as Jeanette's experience was. 
Um, yeah. I just didn't know what to expect, really. So we kind of talked about this one off the air last time as well. And Mm -hmm. there was a bit of a discussion around it on some of the social media, some of the forums and stuff like that. And it was this idea that Jeanette had had kids. You know, I I think she's become a bit of a gay icon over the years. And the assumption was that she was likewise gay. So early on, you know, the reaction was, why the fuck has Jeanette got kids? How did you, how did you feel about the way this book sort of handled, handled that and handled her uh, sexuality? Well, I think, um, I mean, from my perspective and, and I mean, we talked about this before and it was, it was news to me that there was an interview in which, um, uh, the actress turned around and said, I, I played her deliberately am- unambiguous, so you weren't sure. And when I was growing up, I was described as a tomboy, which probably isn't going to be a huge shock to everybody because I'd rather be climbing trees and playing football than the things that girls would, would say that they enjoyed doing. And for a long time, there was a lot of people who made assumptions that I was, you know, I was gay or I was bi or I was anything else. So I think that through your life, you find yourself and, you know, whatever you settle on and you feel comfortable with, I think it's great that you find something and you settle on it and you find comfortable with it. But I never took from the the, the film or anything subsequently that uh, Vasquez was gay. So when, you know, that was explored, when she met somebody that she, you know, she, she really identified with and got on with, I can understand you feeling that about, you know, somebody of the same sex. I don't think that was that much of a shock. Um, and then, of course, she came out and, and she found somebody else. So... I think for me, it was fluid enough not to land on anything um, and also be bold enough to say that, you know, of a certain age, you know, people explore. You, you, I think for me, you are attracted to who you're attracted to, no matter what body or colour skin or anything else that they come in. So I was glad that it stayed ambiguous, to be honest, and never really, you know, put a stamp on she is or she isn't. So I think the actress, Jeanette Goldstein, had a pretty good quote about it saying... That was- um, with Vasquez, I never said she was straight or gay because to her it was nobody's business. But I mean, the book is is pretty much showing that she's at least bi curious, if not bisexual. Um, but it, it is good to see some of that representation as well, you know. So I, I felt it handled her her sexuality pretty well. Yeah, and her cellmate's name was Daisy Paxton. A little shout out there. I know Hicks loves those. <laughs> No, I, I, what is that in reference to? Bill Paxton. Oh, right. Okay. okay. Good God, Adam. Okay. You, keep rack, you keep racking up these uh, these comments. All right. Okay. And well, sorry, just, just, just done Go with ahead, the, the, the kids. Oh, yeah, no, sorry. I was just thinking as well, I didn't finish my thought because I just stopped talking. Um, one of the things as well that I thought was interesting is how they approached the kids. Well, I think there's at one point um, Vasquez turns around and says, if I, I would have a termination, if it wasn't for the fact that I'm never going to get the choice again. Do you know what I mean? So that was almost, and I thought that was quite, and helped to keep it ambiguous as to who she would be more attracted to or um, what her sexuality is. Cause it was more, well, if they're going to take it away and I've got the opportunity now, I'll do it, which felt very much in line with her character. Um uh, and I thought that was both a, a heartbreaking um, and also it felt quite true to, to Vasquez herself for the decision that she made. So. See, I, I'm one of these ones that had always, because of her status as this gay icon, you know, my initial reaction was, what? I thought she was gay. And But, you know, the way the book handles it, I really liked, you know, the, 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 the fluidity, the, the curiousness and the attraction to who you're attracted to, you know, I thought it worked really well to set up this, you know, the later part of the book and give her these, these children. That might've been why some of the other law had never really gone that way because they had also focused on the idea that she didn't have children. You know, it was, it was a brother's, it was a sister, sorry, you know, and, and then other relations. So I, I really liked the way it dealt with it actually, which was very, um, I thought it felt very natural and I thought it worked very well. And like you said, Sarah, you know, that whole bit about 
God, it really did make me angry that part of the book, you know, the 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 forced sterilization. But the the way she responded to it with if I had the choice in the future, I know what I'd do now because at that time she was very committed to what she was doing. You know, she was committed to being a Marine and obviously recognized that her actions while on, you know, you know, you know, she didn't set out to get pregnant, did she? You know, it wasn't an intentional sabotage of of her career. and, And what made it extra gross was that they also, so not only were they going to, she obviously she couldn't raise the children. Um, she had to give them away straight away after birth. She was going to be sterilized. They were also taking all of her womb and all of her eggs and sending them off to some scientific research base. I mean, it's just stacking one up after the other. <laughs> it's horrible. It's awful. V, v really went for it there. And to be fair, the, the the little story nerd part of me here was also like, is that Thomas Spears kind of set up because of the genetic? See? Exactly. The, yeah. Which we, I was kind of like, oh, cool. But then it was also like, what? No. How did you guys feel about the, the way the social commentary was handled in this one? Because like like I said in my Colonial Marines review, not Colonial Marines, Colony Wars review, sci-fi will always be a place for social commentary. It's just part of the fabric of the genre. Colony Wars did it with the subtlety of a brick in the face. And... I think some of this was a bit too overt, but in general, how did you guys feel about uh, about the social commentary? Did it, did it pull you out? Did it work within the narrative? I'm kind of with you, Aaron, in that I agree that sci-fi is a great place for social commentary. I just felt there was a bit too many things in a row that felt very contemporary. Like... We're 180 years into the future. We can explore politics. We can explore social issues for sure. And those can can be relatable to our current times. But when they feel a bit too reflective of our current times, it can kind of pull you out of it a little bit. Yeah, one of the parts I liked was uh, when there is a synthetic as a as a cop. And it was like, you cannot, I, I have no bias. Do not try to influence my decision. So I thought that was, that part was handled well. Yeah, that seems like it was a very deliberate evolution of the earlier part of, of the story with Jeanette and how she was very much dealing with one of those, the the, the corrupt cops, you know, the, the racial bias kind of way that, has come out a lot recently and and to then evolve it with with the synthetic stuff was uh, i think a very nice touch and i think one of those reasonable it felt natural it felt like a natural flow of that technology of that purpose of of that kind of thing so yeah i i did think that worked really well sarah any thoughts on that one I feel as if I'm probably not the best person to give commentary as I've read a very sheltered and lucky life. Um, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, I think um, from my perspective, I think it did it well enough to show that life would never have been easy for Vasquez, if that makes sense, just through the world that we're growing up in, um, the world that's around her and the same, same kind of stereotypes and limited opportunities that are available to people. Um, and I think that can probably be true of uh, anybody from a particular economic status, maybe, um, you know, the, the opportunities that are available uh, and therefore her only way out was to join the Marines, which is sign up and give your life away. And then part of that as well is giving up the opportunity to have children. Um, and so all of that feels as realistic for today as it would be in the future and it kind of makes me feel a little bit sad um but yeah, that's yeah. where we could still be because you know you would hope that we would have all evolved beyond that but broadly speaking i think they tipped their hat enough to it without really laboring it on and just banging and banging away because that would have been on top of the sterilization and everything else i think i would have probably found that quite exhausting to turn mm-hmm. around and read that that's a fair word to use actually exhausting mm-hmm. Because I do think a lot of the commentary was very early on in that Jeanette 
part of the book. Um, don't get me wrong, it's still there in in Letitia's um, Letitia's journey. You know, there's there's um, assumptions and stereotypes made early on um, in her teenage years. You know, but it doesn't it doesn't pile it on as it goes. Um, it feels the thickest in Jeanette's story because there's a lot going off there, you know, with the COVID stuff, with the, the police yeah. brutality stuff, um, and then the gang culture kind of stuff. So it does feel thickest there, I think. And the the thing, the only one that doesn't, I felt like was a well, little bit of a... Letitia does, a does um, encounter it later, of course. So when she goes to become a raider, and it's just her and oh gosh, what's her name? A uh, has. Yeah. And I, I, basically, I she gets told, "You're never going to get it because she's the daughter of somebody." Yeah. It's still, but it's not as heavy as it yeah. could have been if, as it was earlier, I guess. That that that, that was nepotism. Is, yeah. Is what that uh, so was. another piece of social commentary. Yeah. yeah. With the nepotism, which we see a lot of these days. So. The the I think the only thing that I really didn't like in terms of the the social commentary was the COVID stuff. Because it just felt one thing too many, you know. The I've just I've just suffered through this for the last three years, you know. Give give me a break. I don't need another outbreak uh, of um, a very generic flesh eating bacteria. It, it... To be fair, well, it does that... come. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say the same thing. It, it does come into play in the book in terms of how they're yeah. researching the aliens. But yeah, it did feel very COVID how they initially presented yeah. it. Especially like with the um, with Rosanna, you know, and and the treatment of the doctors and their, you know, the, how exhausted and everything they were. Um, it was just it was just a a, a few too many things uh, piled on in that part of the book. Um, I, I mean, I would say at the same time though, just to give just to give our author a bit of a break, which is that I don't know about you lot, but I casually scribble stories and novellas i think aaron i've mentioned to you before i'm trying to figure out how i can fit werewolves into the alien um expanded universe at the moment i think i got it um so i like to scribble things down but i find that quite cathartic um so i imagine that this was being written when we were in the throes and feeling the you know a lot of the pain so i almost would have been surprised if it hadn't found its way in uh, do, do i think the book needed it no I don't, I don't think, to your point, I don't think it added anything to it, but at the same time, I'd have almost been surprised of pretty much any book that's come out and been written in the last three years that isn't somebody expressing their pain and difficulty that they've been through through that. Through that. I, I can forgive no, I mean, it. It's, well. it's, it's, it's fair. It's an entirely fair point, but it also, it's also one of those things that contemporizes it because it's so very obviously COVID, but it's also like ev like you say, all these people, all these creatives, all these authors um, are going through it, or went through it. And it's like, we've gone through it ourselves. Now it's all coming out in the books after the fact. It's like, give us a fucking break. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> let's have some different plots and some different narratives uh, going off, off here. I get what you mean, Sarah. I mean, it's it's very common among creatives to want to put themselves in, into their work. But I also agree with you, Aaron. It just felt like too many contemporary social issues and like i want to see what kind of social issues we have in the far future which could be very different than now but also somewhat relatable at the same time like so i and it was kind of like the the colony war with the three world exit and everything like that it's like this just feels too close to what we're dealing with right now so i think sorry no it might be you and adam actually mentioned um the the culture the mexican culture in the book i was really interested in a lot of the perspective that came up through you know leticia and and jeanette and rosanna as well you know and it even even went as far into some of the architectural stuff with the pyramid that ramon built because it was very obviously called out as like one of the step pyramids of um of aztec kind of stuff so i really i really enjoyed that that is one of the things i do really like about characters is when we get these other cultural perspectives and um, sort of like tints on the alien. You know, I might not have been so convinced with her imagining the aliens in in the vision um, part of the book, 
but to later on you know that would have been a nice way to sort of shine on the alien with um you know with with the cultural background so that was that was something i really did actually quite enjoy what about you guys i like that part a lot um yeah because they they really put in a lot of history i guess you could say Mex- mexican american history you know you had the soldaderas which are like a were a f- female fighting force during the mexican revolution so that, that was brought up again and again you kind of had rosanna and she she was interested in kind of the more what would be i guess pagan aspects of mexican culture and you know that that happened that long time ago as you know spain brought catholicism to the to the americas and a lot of the indigenous people at that time still tried to keep some of their their beliefs ingrained with the, with the with the new catholicism beliefs and that's actually where santa muerta kind of comes from it's kind of a combination of uh mother mary and kind of a mother earth earth or slash death god you know so yeah that that part was really fun to me uh do you remember uh the part where, where she goes into like the like a vision quest in the in the hut they pretty much describe the avp pyramid scene but with engineers <laughs> i was thinking the same thing yeah it's like a sweat lodge ceremony kind of thing um but she was in like a full kind of trip i guess like i was like did they give her something or is that just she's just sweating that hard that you're seeing things at that point but I, I agree. I think that was one of the strongest parts of the book was exploring some of the, the Mexican culture with both Jeanette and then her sister and raising these, these kids. Uh, and we just see a lot of that through, throughout the book and in both, um, in both Jeanette's and Leticia's uh, inner dialogue, uh, less so with Ramon, I think, I think he's more just kind of concerned about power than, than cultural things. Although I think he still at the same time does have some, some um you know cult- cultural re- reflections um but i don't think it was it, it might not have been strictly cultural but it was family you know yeah. it was it was about providing for the vasquez that came down the line um it was about giving the name um the same sort of power that Wayland does or utani does or vickers does and it you know there was some other name drops in here as well um I'm I'm going to quiz first. Did did we pick up on these other potential alien name drops, family name drops? Hmm. There there was a I think Luke Grant in the, yep. Uh, the there's one Harvard Grant Corporation. What what was his um, Mrs's surname though? That's cheating, Ziggs. I see you <laughs> reaching for the book. She was a Kramer. I was going to say I think it's Kramer. Yeah, From well, what's the Kramer that rival, right? Well, how intentional that was, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, we had a Grant and a Kramer in here, and I immediately thought of, of the Grant Corporation, the Kramer rifle. I, I don't think it was intentional, but you know, it, it speaks to the same theme, perhaps, uh, however unintentionally, of the name, the power behind a name, the power behind a family name. So he, he was interested in that regard. I did find it interesting how Ramon and Leticia growing up as siblings, they really didn't get along much, but then as they matured kind of after their college years, Ramon kind of admitted he had not been great with his sister and that he wanted to be better. And um, you see that sometimes with family that initially doesn't get along and then they, they kind of realize that and they try and do better and they try and form more solidarity. I've experienced that personally with, with my extended family. So um that was something I thought the book handled really well. What I think was handled less well was that they were both dating uh, Waylon Yutani family members. <laughs> I'm like, that is one wild coincidence, right? With um, Ramon dating a uh, Yutani and uh, Leticia dating a um, a Vickers, or I guess unofficial Wayland uh, would be a Vickers. Um, and that was uh, interesting seeing those power dynamics. I mean, even in that little Alien Isolation sequel game we played, Aaron Blackout, you have a Yutani there, and you have to think if these these family names are so powerful because of this mega corporation, then yeah, any of their descendants would want to try and maintain that that name and have some celebrity of even having that name. So that was kind of interesting to see. 
Um, but just some of their scheming, like uh, this kid is still in Harvard and he gets invited to the Wayland headquarters and this dude is like, hey, you want to bump? So anyway, uh, we're just going to hand you like all the information to like this top secret alien research project here. Have fun, kid, because we don't know how to weaponize it because that's such a crazy idea, but maybe you'll figure it out. And so it just was like, wait, what? Like, so it felt a bit... Um... The last the last quarter does descend into... Um fanfic realms um and i do mean that in the negative way which is a shame i i think i mentioned earlier i can't remember about the the vicar's timeline it bugged me so much i'm so confused and maybe you'll all set me right back on my path um but as far as i can tell it doesn't make any sense so i was googling away well i wasn't googling away i was looking on your website quite frankly um so meredith vickers was born in 2057 and died in 2093 after spending two years on the Prometheus, which means that she was there, uh, like, at 31 years old, she went off and joined her dad and everything else. Now, she was meant to have been made um, uh, vice president of the company in 2089, which means that in less than two years... Not only is she suddenly the VP of this massive company, she's also wondering what her dad's on about with a ship. She's also found this planet, wandered off out there, decided it's a good point, hidden everything behind her, decided it's going to be an outpost and started it all. I'm so lost. Did the book ever say she personally went there, though? Because, I mean, if you're going by the um, the kind of viral material for Prometheus, there were quite a few worlds that had been discovered and colonized even at the time of prometheus so i wonder if she had just seen something and looked at its statistics and it was like okay this is viable rather than yeah, personally and, have traveled and and maybe that was just part of being a vp but every director or vp that i know doesn't spend a lot of time looking for secret planets and places that they can put research stations that's the job of someone cooler and then the most like a uh, high up person just gets all the credit for it. So them talking about it being this pet project and how she was so interested in it and she's got all these things set up. I'm thinking in two years, we've been building high speed rail for what? 17 years by now. And it, we have and it takes down. it takes five years to get there as well, remember? <laughs> so I'm just... Well, it would have been longer at the time, but <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, I get you there. And it did feel weird that they, they make this this specific secret facility seems so central to their research with the aliens. And again, I thought it was weird with Brenda Moon killing them off because they, before they become adults, because they're so dangerous. And then at the end, we get this throwaway line. Oh yeah, there's also all these other secret alien research facilities. And I'm like, but the book was so focused on this being oh, the most important one. What was that? Yeah, and here's the bacteria, and here's the 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 sort the Ramones like. Oh, and here's the bacteria as well, and here's the thing that will um, cure it, and here's the locations of where it might have been sent to so far. I'm just like, this is not secret. This is not secret. <laughs> this is being passed around like bubble gum. This is. <laughs> I did actually love the alien research though. In this, like, one of the things I regret not getting to really experienced with with resurrection you know was Gediman's lines talking about it's not just the military application you know new alloys new vaccines and stuff like that and that is one of the things i get really excited about in the eu is the exploration exploration of these other things you know it's, it's one of the reasons i found prototype so frustrating was because it toyed with them but didn't go any further with them with this i actually really like the most the majority of the alien focus was on these other uses and the idea of them having this viral agent against the alien it, it's a nice callback to like i mentioned at the start you know it's a callback or seems to potentially be a callback to labyrinth you know as it got on i kind of felt like it perhaps might be a little bit more related to the black goo than perhaps anything specifically labyrinth but it's the same vibe it's the same um same sort of element and i really really enjoyed that it was that was the alien focus you know it wasn't about making these i mean that might be what they wanted ramon to do but the actual research that was taking place dr brendan moon you know it was about the virus um 
although it did sort of veer into being about the xenocytes, which I thought was stupid. <laughs> Not going to lie. The, the image of the tapeworms with the alien bits on them, I thought was a bit uh, a step too far. But the actual, you know, the, the other half of this research being about killing the aliens, I thought was really, really fascinating. And I really liked that that was where it took it rather than making them foot soldiers in something. How did you guys feel about that particular element? Uh, yeah, I like the, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so I like that they were basically looking for ways to find weaknesses in the aliens, like DNA. So they're, they're looking to go past its immune system. So I thought, I thought that was cool, but yeah. And then the xenocytes infecting waterways, but they had the antidote to basically kill them all off. It was all right. <laughs> I mean, that was very evil Megacorp mentality, and I liked it as well because it's like, we'll, we'll infect you and then sell you the vaccine. I thought it was um, maybe a bit megalomaniac, but in terms of um, that sort of corporations equal evil that the EU gets a little bit too heavy into, you know, it, it, it felt right. I kind of agree with you, Aaron, that I... I... I don't like it when they do this like oh here's this crazy new little twist the alien like the um it kind of reminded me of those little alien uh what was it the tubers from marvel's second volume that yeah. had no yeah. point and made no sense yeah and exactly no, no, and they, they actually said it was like a arthropod hybrid so it, yeah the xenocytes reminded me of that also yeah so it's just like you're gonna use these parasite xenomorphs to just put in people and smuggle them to different planets i'm like okay what happens then do they just chest burst like a normal alien like so i don't know well, wasn't that wasn't that the whole point of like the people breaking down thing as well it did start start to get a little bit murky as to what was related to what later on yeah but i think I, it like oozes out of your orifices which is always pleasant <laughs> What about you, Sarah? How did you feel about the alien think, experimentation yeah, or Brian, I was just part of this? Clicking on the mute button and being incredibly unsuccessful. Apologies. Um, for me, I liked the everything that you just talked about. Everybody, I completely agree um, and echo what you're all saying. What I thought was super cool was when I think it's when they're early on talking about the experiments. They roll a little ball in of the bacteria from a tiny little tube in the ceiling, and the Xeno just starts going mental because he can already sense what there is in there but what i thought was most interesting is when they describe what happens to it so the blood is no longer acids and that's i can't remember the exact word and this is going to drive me mad but they basically talk about that it's the neutralization of its acid blood that kills it i think i had to read it again the other day because i was like, i'm sure i'm misremembering this but i'm i'm pretty sure that in that part of the book they basically say that that's the way in which it's killing it is because it's congealing and nullifying the acidic properties within its blood, which is what kills it, because it turns its own blood toxic against it, which I was like, and I missed it the first time around when I read it. And the second time around, I was like, there was something around here that kind of like was just niggling in my brain. And I was like, oh, okay, that explains what's actually happening, because sometimes it's a bit, oh, we're going to release this, and, you know, people get funny heads or whatever, but I felt as though they actually did a better job of explaining what happened and why it could be so detrimental to the alien that it was exposed to. See, so if you just yeah, read that, if you found it in the book, did you find it? It looks like you might have done. No. Oh, I'll have a look. That that's that's where I think a lot of you know, when we're nerding out, we like these details. We like these pseudo scientific kind of um, explorations of these fake creatures, and that that's when you know that's when it appeals and and really resonates. So that that's, that was a cool moment. Yeah, I I, re I really enjoyed the Brenda Moon stuff until until Utani showed up and fucked it all up. So uh, that that was that was a fun part of it. And then we had Dylan take take him out. Uh resurrection style <laughs> dylan was the one who was infected that broke out oh yeah i i don't think i liked the dylan bit i think that's when it all sort of started to 
really fall apart for me because I I had memories of um, I had flashbacks. Sorry, should I say to the guys, the guy uh, escaping Bar National in book one, you know, and it being a dream because there was no fucking way that was going to happen. So, you know, Brenda Moon had all these really well in place uh, security measures that stopped everything. And then this guy can basically strolls out of, of, of the, um, the facility. Although that is something I'm interested in, you know, that kind of where they've modified enough that they can kind of interact with the aliens you know, I always think of it more as when I play with that kind of scenario in my head for things, I think of it, I tend to go for a chest burst of being in there. But like the idea of the genetic experimentation um, resulting in it is is an interesting thing. So it doesn't work for me in the book, but it's an element that I would quite happily see explored properly in, in some of the other stuff. You know, we, right. we, can, we can't get that into Charybdis as well, you know, with um, with Blue which is, again, one of the things I fucking love in that book. But not in here, not in here. It didn't, it didn't really gel for me. Well, I found the, I found the bit I was looking for. Okay. Um, so it's uh, after, it's not long actually after the first like, main focus on Jeanette. So they talk about the, um, the orb coming in and the xenomorph going crazy. And it says uh, the projectiles sprayed from the orb to pierce the exterior. So it convulsed. Um, as the bacteria invaded its body, it snapped the air as if it was choking, and then its body fell to the ground. The bacteria caused toxic shock in the xenomorph faster than in humans. It could lie there for hours in a delirium as the microscopic invader took over its system. And then Matey Boy comes along to slice bits off it and then take it away in little vials. And Brenda Moon smiles and says, uh, the bacteria had neutralised the acidic blood of the xenomorph, which had led to its death. So I was like, oh, okay. That makes, I mean, it doesn't make 100% sense, but at least it goes some part of the way of going, it's a bacteria, it's bad for xenomorphs. Off we go. So. And that, it kind of reminded me of uh, phalanx to a bit with the, with the leaf, the caminous leaf. Yeah, that's a good chat. I hadn't actually thought about that one. Um, so one of the things I did, just to deviate back towards characters, one of the things I did actually really like about this was Letitia's journey didn't end in sunshine and roses. You know, she was following in her mother's path. And then when she was, like, fucked over, she, and she went, you know, she said, to you, right, fuck you then. I'm not, I'm not being a part of this establishment if you're not going to, play by the, the rules and i liked the because life doesn't go to plan you know life does not work out the way we all might dream it to be um and that realistic part of her character arc really worked very well for me i was like yes this is real this is mature i dig it i really like the camaraderie between her and her fellow raiders as well and yeah it was kind of a uh, cool curveball seeing her go from being a marine to private military you know private military is usually the bad guys in, in these kind of stories but she convinces a lot of her other fellow marines uh, some that have already left like hey come come join me in this thing because she's when she's hired one of the the um the requests she makes is that or requirements is that she needs to be able to to recruit her own team because they had worked so well together in the past um, so yeah, I, I thought that was interesting to see her part of Waylon Yutani's private security force here. And, it, it, you know, it, during the process, she falls in love with the person who hired her, which is interesting. And, and he is kind of also framed for, um, everything that goes down here. And so they're going to be on the run again after this. So I guess with that, you do have kind of a room for a sequel with that setup. Oh, there was def but, uh, definitely sat, um, left oh, wide open for a sequel. I don't think I'd want one, but it, it, it was there. What about you guys? How did you feel about that character arc, character trajectory for, for Letitia? Um, I mean, I 
I hated all the romances. Every single romance in this, I hated. Um, that between everybody, everybody okay. apart from if it was familiar is, relationships. Is, I hated is it. this why you didn't like Echo? Was it too heavy on the romance? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is this is a big part of why I didn't uh, like Echo, and I think. I mean, I could talk about this for ages, about Ramon and his skeevy getting paid for sex with the next-door neighbour whose kid he's... It was all just a bit. But if I was going to sum it up and then let somebody else talk, um, I would probably say that she's on a perfectly good planet and she's talking about, I want to go see the world and I want to go to all these new places. And she's got this really handsome guy called Avery there for the taking. But no, she wants to wander off because she doesn't want to stay on that planet and do some farming. And then she gets together with someone who wants to go and sit on a planet and do some farming. And I was like, this is this is not a, this is no character development. You've just swapped Avery for Jacob. They want exactly the same thing just because it's a different planet doesn't make the fam the farming any more interesting, does it? So for me, there was just such a lack of Jacob uh, had an accent though. So huh? sorry. Jacob had an accent though. So, <laughs> so a very you, sophisticated you. British accent. <laughs> farming with you, Adam. <laughs> So, so I guess V Castro, she's originally from America, but she actually lives in England now. So I think that's where she's getting, she has the hots for English guys. <laughs> I, I hear that's the thing American women like is, is the English accent. So, yeah. But uh, going back to, to that, that character arc, I felt like, you know, both Leticia and Ramon, they're, they're just trying to make themselves go above their station in life and, you know, with Leticia, when the Marines didn't work out, the next logical option was this this amazing private security offer. So it made sense, I thought. Yeah, that's a good way of actually looking at the journey is getting above their station in life, you know, because that's, I think, a lot of... It's, it's fighting the institution, isn't it? A lot of this book's message is fighting against the hand you dealt whether systematic it's... disadvantages yes that's it and and that was a part that i did actually genuinely enjoy about the the journey of these characters is their success in doing it you know i might have equated it more to life not w working as you plan but you also tend to try and take those advantages as you are given them as even if you didn't expect them and yeah it just i saw a lot of I guess, I guess I saw a bit of my own character trajectory in there, you know, in, in not being where you expect to be or being in some random, wildly different place uh, that you might have, I, I have ended up in a career I avoided <laughs> when I was, when I was training, I was like, Oh, there's no point in doing this because every fuck is going to be doing it. So I'll never get a job in it. So I just, it was a little bit of a thing I enjoyed in terms of um, seeing myself in there. Now, I've actually run out of notes. Do you guys have anything specific uh, you want to bring up about the book? Everybody else is checking their notes now. For uh... <laughs> I did think it was kind of fun seeing her and Jacob immediately fall for each other at this like fancy Wayland uh, event or something, and her brother was all like, "Behave, you know, to be cool," and she's all like, "Screw that! I'm very attracted to this guy." you want to get out of here and go to this crazy dive bar in a bad part of town? Like it was kind of fun. So as silly as the romances were, I thought they did kind of have their moments, you know, they weren't all bad. And they, they go to the strip club with the stripper with the robotic leg that can That's do crazy right. tricks. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 was cool. that was cyberpunk cool. Cyberpunk vibe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. That cyberpunk. Uh, what do they call that bar in cyberpunk? The afterlife. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I mean, I went down some rabbit holes reading this book. I'm not going to lie. Um, I got really rabbit holy around the different artists that they were talking about, or the different um, the way in which they were describing Lorena. Um, I, I went down there. So one of the artists, and I apologise for my pronunciation in advance. I can barely speak English. So um, I think it was Frioa. Kalo, Kalo, K A L O. Frida um, Kahlo. Kahlo, thank you. <laughs> thank you for rescuing me. I was dying there. Um, 
So uh, what I thought was quite interesting was um, a lot of the work that she did was self-portraits and a lot of them were her um, were self-portraits of her. She, she had some real medical kind of problems throughout her life and it would show like bits coming out of her. Um, and it made me think about David's drawings quite a lot as well when they were talking about that type of artwork, which I thought was fascinating because you could see the parallels. The ones that they picked was was really, really smart. Um, and I saw some of the imagery from that, and that that just really rang true with with a lot of that um, history that we have through the Ilium universe as well. Um, the other thing that they did is um, they described the young uh, xenomorph as a, help me, six, Landro? L-L-A-N-D-R-O. You muted. Yandro. Yeah, oh, yeah. The, the LL thing. makes a Y sound. Yandro, Yandro. Okay, um, and that is a uh, a figurine, um, and that the the company is a bellflower. Uh, the company emblem, sorry, is a bellflower, which kind of looks like a um, uh, ovipositor. It looks like an egg. It looks like an alien egg. Um, so I thought that was that was very interesting as well. Um, and uh, the person who uh, originally set up the company and everything else, um, they actually ended up uh, becoming bigger and joining two companies together, uh, Mitsui, which is a Japanese company, and theirs, which was an American company. And I was like, just look at this. The, the, the parallels are incredible. So there was a few things in there that I – there were some more, but I'll get boring. But, um, yeah, there was a few in there what I thought was was really smart and really interesting as to what they were referring back to throughout Mexican heritage. They did focus on one piece of future tech, which was the the narwhals, which are kind of like jet skis and hover bike hybrids. And uh, they come into play. There's there's a scene when they're just on a mission as part of the Raiders earlier in the book, but, but these bikes come into play in ultimately defeating the alien queen in the end. Um, another thing I thought was kind of cool was the, even though we didn't spend a lot of time on this extrasolar planet in the end, um, the descriptions of it were pretty cool, how geothermal it was with these pits and everything, which also comes into play in, in their defeat of the aliens. I thought that was an interesting sort of, uh, probably unintentional again, but parallel to Prometheus, you know, with them filming in Iceland and, and using it as a very... A primordial planet so i thought that i thought that was kind of probably unintentional but it, it, it gave me a little bit of a smile and the imagery of that as well you know of this step pyramid coming out of because they terraformed a, a, a lot of it as well already hadn't they you know it was this jungle-esque place with this step pyramid emerging out of it then surrounded by all this primordial world and i just thought it was fantastic imagery very AVP. Yeah. In, well, uh, the pyramid itself was like the facility, right? Yes. So it kind of reminded me of AVP 2010 because you had this like human yeah, the, pyramid the shaped facility around built over a predator yeah. pyramid. Yeah. And also the the moment where Yutani like tricks this guy into getting infected with a bunch of other people and the aliens like, oh, just go in this room. It'll be okay. You know, don't you trust me or whatever. And, um, it reminded me of the clause 88C of your employment agreement yeah, as at the start. In, in AVP 2010. And I'm like, at least in Aliens Infiltrator, they were smart enough to use the, uh, the convicts, you know. <laughs> I I really and like... Just, right, so, sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Okay. No, just to check on... on and So in the, when they approach the pyramids, because it's quite a... It's like every room has got its own super special locked door. And it's quite difficult to kind of traverse the laboratory or, or the facility itself without having 25 different keys and everything else. I suppose there were two things that confused me. Um, number one, how are the xenomorphs pretty much outside and just roaming around freely to kill Julia and everything else? I was like, that, I know Dylan was just banging buttons left, right and centre, but is that just the cause of it or... Was there some other kind of failure? And the second part of it is when Letitia and Ramon um, and all the her Marines and everything are, are outside of the complex and they see a dropship coming down and a guy steps out in a lab 
coat. I got a bit confused about whether that's supposed to be Dylan or whether that's supposed to be somebody else. I got a bit lost as to who it was that had gone to a dropship and had three xenomorphs behind them. That was Dylan, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I was I was confused about the, the door lock bit as well. I think Ramon had this line like, well, if I unlock these doors to get us in, it's going to unlock everything. Yeah, that was um, very poor <laughs> writing. Yeah. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to lie there. That kind of shorthand cheaty dramery kind of set of stuff i think is always very disappointing but you did it did just make me think of um there is some absolutely wonderful descriptive imagery of the hive where they they refer to it as like um as like a church of pain and death or so some words to that effect which i should have written down but i didn't but there's there was yeah some absolutely wonderful um descriptions uh, when they actually got into the hive and there was all this misery and, and and birth around them that was really really well done and, and i'll try and, i'll try and find it while you guys talk actually do uh, what did you what did everybody think of lorena herself because they were said there was three alien queens two are dead on the floor and then obviously she had gone some way to heal and work around all the horrible horrible things that they'd done to her by chopping her arms off and all the stuff you were talking about earlier yeah not only did they sever her limbs to incapacitate her but they removed like the lower part of her jaw so she couldn't bite i think she still had her inner jaws um but yeah brenda moon was getting concerned because she was starting to grow back pointed stumps of these appendages you know uh that she could spike people with but they they embedded these like shells that they could detonate in her crown that would have this bacteria that would kill her instantly but i think those like she formed horns around them or something like that um so it was kind of interesting to see that um again it just feels like too much of a time jump happened with the five years where they're just like it feels like they're instantly there because brenda moon was concerned about this happening with the queen and then it feels like we just pick back up right there with that and yeah, I, I, think I, I kind of, I kind of feel like the Brenda Moon sections weren't in chronological order. It, it seemed because it, the first Brenda Moon section came immediately on part two, which would was when you know the kids were born. So I, I do, I agree with the timeline was kind of shoddy yeah. there. Maybe I'd have to check the dates again because I know some of the chapters did have the dates, and that was another thing because. And this kind of goes to things being a little disjointed now with the EU. I think this was around the time where the USCM becomes the UACM. If we're going by Fireteam Elite, if we're counting that as actual lore. So I would have, it would have been cool to see mention of that, but. Um, I think, I think one of the, the, the things that they talked about as well with Lorena, um, like having evolved, I mean, timelines all aside, like who knows, could have been 20 years, could have been 20 minutes, got no clue. Um, but, and I'm not quite sure, as you know, I'm not a gamer. So whereas I have the figures um, with the new game, when they have like the Prowler alien and the Spitter alien and the Jumpy alien or whatever they're called, uh, all those different xenomorphs. Um, in this one, they talk about her spitting acidic blood. So her inner mandible has become some kind of barbed, tongue type dexterous thing and she also spits acid or spits blood um to take people out as well so i wasn't sure whether that's in line with how the xenomorphs from the game do it whether there's any lore around that or whether it's just there's there's always been kind of a difference i think in the games you've always had more of a spitter type of alien and then in the expanded universe um and of course originally with resurrection actually even with alien 3 you see the the alien spit at one point um but yeah in in some parts of the expanded universe it's just some aliens spit acid and it doesn't really explain it or anything but the games have always tried to make it more of like this is a, a its own type of alien yeah, which is something I've never really liked in games, to be honest, because I think it's a, a an ability that they should all be able to have. You know, we first saw it in Alien 3, um, and it's not very clear at all in, in that film, but, you know, it was set up as the runner being able to do it. And then, of course, we see it in Resurrection. And I don't think we see it in any other theatrical setting, do we? I don't think so, no. Mm. So it's, it's always been the, something the I think they can all do. 
just the runner one aliens spinning. Are oh, the runner aliens are favorite. Yeah, they they were in one of the games AVP 2010. They were called the the jungle aliens, even though they were the runners and they were the spitters. They spitters, yeah. Uh, uh, I can't find oh, the okay. exact. I can't find the exact passage I'm thinking of. But here here was one that I did like, um, which was when they kill Julia because um, she's all hived up and infected and about to burst. Well, no, does burst. Sorry, um, and somebody puts a bullet in her. Um, Ramon's entire body jerked at the sound of every bullet that echoed in the chamber of life and death, a birthing suite and cemetery at the same time. Stunning. I do like that one. I mean, don't get, I, I find V a bit all over the place, to be honest, in terms of the, the quality of writing, but moments like that I really liked. But then there's some real shit dialogue, like we're both mel- military girls, made the best person win, which was just, I, I didn't like piece of dialogue it's just so random but yeah um anything else guys any other oh no i i didn't really uh, elaborate on uh, lorena as well i love that i thought that was brilliant it was it was not doing the typical alien thing of uh, an alien comes out of a fucking sloth or something like that you know it, it was it was taking something it was taking the DNA reflex. It was taking this notion of the alien's adaptability in a different direction. And I thought the idea of her evolving these stumps into weapons of their own, you know, not necessarily regrowing them, which I think Ridley Scott thinks they can do is, is his interpretation of, um, (laughs) it was a deleted scene in alien, you know, where it would have lost, um, I think it was his tail and it would have grown back. And then um, in Covenant, in the commentary, he said that the alien that got split in two would just grow back again. Um, but no, it, it was a, a more reasonable and realistic um, direction to take the adapt- adaptability of the alien. And I thought it really worked. And, you know, some of this idea of this hive xenomorph, oh, I just said xenomorph, um, alien sort of chitin kind of, way uh, of these arm spikes was was really interesting it actually gave me vibes of um you don't like the Car- xenomorph term either i thought you just didn't like gotcha i i like xx i prefer to think of it as xenomorph xx121 i like it as a generic term for aliens that they discover um it reminded me of some artwork from avp there was another company and i can't remember the name they pitched some wildly different takes on the alien and um, the the life cycle and, and the creatures and uh, it's gonna annoy the shit oh, out i know what now. you're talking about i think that was wasn't that uh patrick totopolis did yes that, that was it, it was, it was and Tatopoulos. it had the queen on these like little spike appendages i know what you're talking yeah. about some of that earlier avp art so that that was what i got sort of vibes of in um in my imagination, uh, while picturing uh, Lorena. There's one real cool scene. It was basically Muhammad Zed scene. They're getting chased by face huggers, and he's shooting a flamethrower, and then one of the queen basically stabs him with its two stump hands, barb stumps hands, and squeezes and stabs him at the same time. I, I thought all the marine death scenes were pretty pretty good and well-written. Yeah, there was there was there's some good deaths in this. To say most of it was um not really that that focused on that kind of uh, element of the sci-fi, but when it when it got there, I, I I enjoyed it, yeah. Yeah, it was just a bit too brief like we have already stated. Yeah. And I and I think that for me the just on the the other marines, I don't think we've talked about them pretty much at all, and I think that's likely just because they were so flipping forgettable. I thought they were kind of like, I don't know. I, I kind of liked them as a team. Um, it was interesting because two of them were in a, a relationship together, Nathan and Muhammad, I think. So it was interesting to see that in the same squad. Um, but that's generally discouraged, I believe. I think they they mentioned that too, but I don't know. That's another one of those things like a chop chalk up to like, oh, it's in the, the future. Maybe they've relaxed on that. And I guess it's the same thing with um leticia and jacob like he's her employer like yeah but i mean (laughs) but they also make that point they're like well you can't really control 
you know people's desires in in that way so well i, th I think it's always been they encouraged the the carnal act not necessarily the emotional and it it wasn't patrick totopolis adam it was constantine circus oh, okay patrick totopolis yeah. did do art for app though he did i think he did some of the pitch no that was phil norwood he did do he did do some of the artwork on on avp but yeah the the spiked appendage um artwork was um constantine circus he worked on a lot of a lot of the films actually i think he worked on the predator and predators and both avps and prey sorry anything else guys i think even though we've all kind of been like middling to lukewarm about this i'd say um yeah i guess i'd just say if if you're just looking for an aliens action book i don't know if i'd recommend it but if you particularly like the character of jeanette vasquez even though this focuses more on our children than her i think it's i think it's worth a read um i just feel like unfortunately there were a number of things in terms of the world building aspects and in terms of the the conflict with the xenomorph and the focus i would have liked to have been more on on jeanette vasquez but uh -huh. It's again, it's not bad. It's it's worth a read. Depending on what you're looking for. I I I like I don't see myself revisiting this. Like I, I really enjoyed the Jeanette Vasquez part of it. I wanted more of that. I didn't really I didn't really get on with Letitia or Ramon. I was I was more interested in Jeanette. I, I also wouldn't be interested in seeing them come back. I'd like to see some of the themes and concepts again revisited but not necessarily these guys um yeah it, i found it middling i i probably won't revisit this one for a long time any final thoughts uh, ziggs um like you guys had mentioned they do kind of leave it open for a sequel with the with the mention of having access to all these different labs where they're doing xeno research so if there were to be a sequel i would just hope that it's much more alien centric and you know now now that we've got all the character development out of the way we could just focus on the fun stuff as far as i'm concerned sarah yeah i mean would i read it again sure i actually think i would and i think the main reason is that um even though i've read it twice um the probably the last third of the book i i don't really remember that well if that makes sense so maybe it just needs to be a bit of time to go by and then i can uh, now I know what to expect from the book that I might pay a bit more attention towards the end. So I would read it again. Um, however, I think I've got three books on the bookcase that are new and I haven't read yet and I would definitely read first. But I could imagine the next six months, I'll probably read this again. Um, and um, I think a lot of the stuff that we've talked about today about, you know, the social inequities and um, some of the stuff around the hive itself. I think I'd probably spend more time reading that rather than racing through it which i felt like i was a little bit because i wasn't a big fan of the characters whereas this time i can just focus on the other stuff but i don't think it's a bad book i think that there are probably four or five that i could name that are worse than this um well, in the movies, the, yes, yeah. there is an entire run from dh press that's probably about <laughs> the same level as um as this steel I egg. Think. Steel yeah oh well no steel eggs Steel legs far worse than this. Steel legs down the bottom with uh, Colony War. But you know, we forgot to bring up the line on your shirt, Sarah, because um, that was kind of uh, significant in the book. L. Uh, L. Let's, let me see on, how Steve. I do here. El Regreso uh, Siempre Vive. Is that it? Maybe? Yeah. El Riesco okay. Siempre Vive. The Risk Always Lives, which was written on Jeanette's armor in the film. Um, if I'm, or maybe her weapon. Yeah, her, um, her, her, yeah, her gun. Okay. Um, and that line is kind of carried over to Leticia, who who takes on that line as kind of a, a creature herself, I would from, say. Um, Jeanette got it from her grandmother? It, it, yeah, her grandfather. I can't remember. Grandfather. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a nice, like, family little motto, I think, which leans a little bit on the fan Vicky side of the fence but it was still cool and i did like seeing that as a um as a motto as as a uh encouragement think, for a way of life i think and i think as well it was um it was less irritating than it eventually became of how many times they mentioned that bandana so 
Right, before we before we spiral off again then. Um thank you everybody for listening or watching. Um Adam, do you want to whore us out? As I'm the one that has sure. to do it on, on Sundays, you can you can, do it you on can the always find us on our website, avpgalaxy.net, where we have uh, a lot of different features like interviews, editorial pieces, and of course the latest updates on all things Alien and Predator. Also, old school message boards where you can talk to us and other fans. And you can also find us on all the major social channels: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And of course, YouTube. So if you'd like to watch these podcasts, uh, we we have the video versions on YouTube. Sarah, do you want people to follow you on Twitter or would you rather them not? Absolutely not. I am the least interesting, <laughs> uh, least interesting person on Twitter. So so don't look for me there. It's it's a boring place to be. Read Vasquez instead. Much more interesting. <laughs> Ziggs, do you have any place uh, you want to direct vote to? Honestly, the forums is like the only even thing close to social media I do. So everything else I kind of just lurk on. So find me on the forums, Ziggs456, that's me. Mostly in the, the literature board. Yes. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, only Twitter, at underscore Corporal Hicks. And that's Alien, Predator, all the nerdy kind of other stuff I'm into um, when I'm feeling sociable. I'm going through a non-sociable phase at the minute, I'll be honest. <laughs> But if you'd like to follow me personally, it's just at Ridgetop21 on both Twitter and Instagram. Before we sign off, a uh, bit of just news on the, the Titan books front, I guess. So the most recent Titan book, um, Alien Enemy of My Enemy, just released digitally. It still hasn't released physically, interestingly enough. But I, I think mean it's in a... the States. I've got a copy on my oh, shelf. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, in the States, just it comes out States. this well this week it's while we're recording. <laughs> So there are no other new alien books planned at the moment. However, I think I saw in our forums, it was just announced they're doing another another trilogy pack. Interestingly enough, uh, Cold Forge prototype and then Inferno's Fall, which I wouldn't have grouped prototype with those two. Charybdis. Oh, right. Right. Into Charybdis. That's right. So the two Alex White ones and then prototype. Which is a weird pack. I mean, I, I actually quite I liked Prototype. I thought it was a solid read, but I don't see how it really fits in between those two. But maybe, maybe that was release order. I can't quite remember. Yeah, it was. There we go, then. So maybe not thematically all relevant to each other, but that's the that's the publishing order. And it's a good one. I think that's a good collection to recommend to people because... Uh, the Cold Forge and Intercaribdis are damn fine alien novels that will make that one an easy one to say you know if you've got a buddy if you see people on reddit facebook whatever asking about books to get into um there's some very convenient omnibuses now um the the shadow trilogy book man that's gonna be like it's gonna be like that thick i picked up (laughs) well oh god yeah because charybdis is giant charybdis is like 450 pages and cold forge isn't short either like well, Cold Forge was just typical sort of length, but yeah, Charybdis is one of the longest alien novels. Damn. Still a recommended book, uh, Omnibus, though. But yeah, that's oh, cool. I, my mistake. Phalanx came out before Charybdis. So. Ah, but know. Phalanx is branded aliens, not alien. Wow. Uh, it's AVP now. <laughs> Only the <laughs> one specific short is AVP. <laughs> Well, it's aliens versus predators. It's an entirely different branding, Adam. Well, I wonder, like, yeah, I, that seems to be the new AVP branding. Like, if Marvel ever launches those comics, if it'll be aliens versus predators. I think that's just a very specific time thing. It's a shame there's no new books announced at the minute, but Enemy of My Enemy is up there. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful I'm going to fucking love it because I did really enjoy Inferno's Fall. And I'd like... Um, I'd like the next one to be to be solid as well. We'll see. We Come on, Mary get, Giovanni. We Come still on. We need to get through Rift War because you know I like That's my AVP. The only alien book I've not been able to get through. Have you read it, Ziggs? Yeah. I was oh, honestly Rift War made Vasquez better for me. Let's just put it that way. Oh man, it does not fill which, me with hope. Which is a huge shame because it's co-written by Yvonne Navarro, who did um, Music of the Spears, which is one of my favorite alien books. And some of the good shorts in the recent um, 
omnibus, not omnibus, anthology. But it, it was also co-written by her husband who wrote fucking Prototype, and you know how much no, I it, hate... Infiltrator. Infiltrator, yes, yeah, sorry, not Prototype. Um, and you know how much I fucking hate that. I, I hated it much less than you. I think I was kinder to that one. I just... Um, the, the character Honaker just got such a visceral reaction from me. I don't think I've ever hated a fictional character as much <laughs> as I hate Honaker in that book. <laughs> but I think you're right, Aaron. I think it's been a rough past year for Titan. So uh, hopefully we get some new announcements and hopefully they can bring it back a little bit. I'm just thankful the I anthologies mean, turned out good. I was going to say, one thing that I would say is that as bad as the books have been, the comics have been worse. So the last maybe one wasn't they can too take bad. a little win. The third arc wasn't too bad. Uh, I think we have a review of that we recently recorded, Aaron. But yeah, that that's in the bank to edit at the minute. Oh, is it? Uh, so, yeah. Although I I have picked up the first issue of the new Predator arc today, and I've read it through. I liked it. I thought it was off to a good start. Although it it did end the way I hoped it wouldn't end. That was very stereotypical, and I I think doubling down on some you of the come with me if you want to live. Well, uh, the whole co- the whole issue, I was waiting for Theta to show up and save them. Um, and then through most of the issue, it's like, yep, the fucking predators are on it. They're actually they're actually being, you know, deadly. Maybe they've taken on some of the criticism. And then I was like, just please don't make Theta show up, kill the guy, <laughs> and um, end it that and and go from that way. And that is exactly how that issue ends, with the predator's face blowing up and Theta doing Arnie's come with me if you want to live. Well, it'll be long out by the time this episode (laughs) That's true. Yeah, good point. But anyway, we digress already as we always do. But yeah, thank you um, Sarah, thank you Ziggs uh, for coming to join us and talking about... It's nice to have some other voices on this show other than just me and Adam. Um, So it's very much appreciated. Um, Everybody out there, um, if you've got any comments, uh, you want to uh, drop us any feedback you know you can email us at uh, podcast at avpgalaxy.net you can always comment on the video on the forums on the social posts and if you are listening to this on a place like itunes that allows um reviews please do because it helps our visibility and all the bloody algorithms and all that sort of stuff the more we commented on the more we reviewed same for youtube you know it just helps other fans find us and if you know uh, other people out there who might be interested in in hearing our thoughts or hearing some of our other you know uh, interview episodes, uh, please do share us with those guys and uh, help us you know help us reach more fans. This has been Corporal Hicks, Ridge Top, Ziggs, Sarah. Signing off. Although maybe I should start to think of thematic uh, ends for these as well as. Uh, <laughs> the intros that I'm going for at the minute. But thank you, everybody.